Hello and good morning. My name is Lorenz Raber from Bern University Hospital, Switzerland. Switzerland is located about 2,000 kilometers southern to where David Erling is coming from, from Sweden. The topic of my talk is pharmacological treatment of vulnerable plaques, VPs, background and a little information on the ongoing Pacman Amy trial. These are my disclosures. The morphological architecture of plaques leading to coronary thrombosis and subsequent death is characterized in two thirds of cases by a, as you can see here, lipid or necrotic core, a large plaque burden that does not necessarily compromise the lumen so much and a thin overlying fibrous cap with macrophages on the top. And as you can see here, as I said, in two thirds of cases in this large meta-analysis summarizing more than 1,800 autopsy uh, deaths, this was found, this plaque type was found to be the leading cause for thrombosis, for coronary thrombosis. Now, tools to study these plaques in vivo are available and you are already familiar with Grayscale IWUS that is a great tool to mainly measure plaque burden, one of the vulnerability characteristics, which we clearly know since PROSPECT. And you're also familiar with near infrared spectroscopy, which is an FDA approved method to determine uh, the lipid, lipid pools or the lipid load. In addition, there is the light based method optical coherence tomography with which you can also detect lipid as shown here in a lipid rich plaque. But on top of that, very precisely measure the cap thickness, the thickness of the fibrous cap and uh, assess as well a macrophage um, accumulations. So these three methods, the benefit of these three methods are that they provide images with a very high signal, uh, with a very low signal to noise ratio and are therefore the best methods to correlate vulnerable plaque with future cardiovascular outcomes. A little bit less precise, but certainly playing an increasingly important role is coronary computer tomography and geography as shown here, which can detect lipid rich lesions, so-called low attenuation plaques as well. So this table now summarizes the four recent natural history trials that associated NIRS, the upper two, one of them was presented before, or OCD detected vulnerable plaques in a total of 3,600 patients with cardiovascular outcomes. And all the four studies found a, as you can see here at the right side, a two to seven times risk increase during a follow-up from one to four years at a patient level. And the individual endpoints you can see here that were chosen by the four studies. The best methodologies, however, were clearly implemented by the two near studies because they also reported, as you can see here, on the lesion-specific association between the vulnerable plaque and lesion-specific clinical outcomes. And again, in the presence of vulnerable plaques, as defined by NIRS, there was a three to eight times risk increase for these events if the, the uh, vulnerable plaques were present. Now, similar observations, interestingly, were obtained by a recent CCTA substudy of the Scott Hart trial. CCTA derived low attenuation plaques without obstruction, here represented by the blue, blue Kaplan-Meier curve. Uh, 
were associated with a almost seven times risk increase throughout five years for the occurrence of fatal or non-fatal MI. So really altogether, we can conclude that non-obstructive lipid rich plaques associate with adverse major cardiovascular outcomes. Now the relevant question, the relevant question is really how clinically we should react in the presence of vulnerable plaques if they are identified with CT or intracoronary imaging in addition to the administration of optical medical therapy that you would anyway give. Two approaches should be considered. One is to directly address the vulnerable plaque by local treatment, for example, by stent. And this is covered by Greg Stone in the next talk. Such a strategy limits the effect on the treated lesion, but saves the patient, of course, from systemic side effects that a drug, a systemic drug may would have. It entails a short procedure as these uh, non-obstructive lesions are very easy to treat, but still there remains a minimal uh, uh, procedural risk of about 1%. The costs are relatively high at short term, but not so much uh, at a long-term perspective. Another approach includes systemic medical treatment. That's a topic of my presentation. Systemic medical therapies have the great advantage to act on the entire vascular bed, but may as cause systemic side effects. You need to administer these drugs per se during a long-term phase and compliance might be an issue. However, there's no interventional risk that you take if you treat a plaque uh, locally. Long-term costs might be higher. And here on both sides, you see the ongoing or already finalized trials that addressed or that studied these two individual approaches. Now, which systemic therapies for vulnerable plaque treatment exist and what is the evidence supporting their use? Of note, the studies we will discuss mainly included vulnerable patients and not necessarily had the requirement to, um, uh, to prove the presence of a vulnerable plaque, but we can actually assume that there were a lot of vulnerable plaques in these patients. So first of all, the first strategy would entail antithrombotics on top of aspirin, for example, studied in the Pegasus or Compass trial. This mainly concerns secondary prevention situations and the clear limitation is increased bleeding, bleeding hazards. Statins are the best studied medications against vulnerable plaques with endless and consistent and robust evidence from both uh, clinical studies and imaging studies. Anti-PCSK9 antibodies lower LDLC for about 50 to 70% and have much less side effects as compared to statins where muscle pain clearly is the leading side effect that leads to discontinuation. The costs are, are however higher and there is robust clinical as well as imaging evidence that these drugs are efficacious in treating vulnerable plaques. The new kid on the block is in Clizeron, an mRNA-based LDL lowering therapy that needs to be injected only three times a year in the first year, but there's no clinical outcome study and no imaging study available so far. And the mixed bag is represented by anti-inflammatory drugs with neutral and positive clinical studies and actually no evidence from imaging studies. The side effects here play an important role, infections, for example, and the costs sometimes can be very high. I would like to guide you through a few anti-inflammatory drugs in the next minutes. First of all, I would like to review the situation for low-dose methotrexate, which was studied in 5,000 high-risk patients with previous MI or multivessel diabetic disease, and methotrexate, as compared to placebo, did not show any effect on this uh, ischemic combi combined endpoint throughout 
for years. So low-dose methotrexate is, cannot be considered as an effective drug to treat vulnerable plaques. Conversely, the IL-1B antibody canakinumab, at least when administered in the highest uh, investigated dose, did show significant reduction in the primary endpoint cardiovascular death MI or stroke and had effects on both MI and any revascularization, but not on death and can therefore be considered as a successful anti-inflammatory drug. However, the limitation comes with increased hazards for the occurrence of uh, sepsis, which of course is a major limitation, as is the cost for the treatment. More interesting probably is colchicine that has recently been extensively studied. This slide shows the prime results of the LODOCO2 trial in which uh, more than 5,000 patients with stable coronary artery disease were randomized to either receiving colchicine or placebo throughout the mean follow-up of 28 months. And you see that the number needed to treat is very low. So there is a clear benefit in patients who um, supported actually for the study duration colchicine in terms of ischemic, uh, ischemic primary endpoint. The um, limitation is that about 20% of the patients will not support it well due to may, may, mainly uh, GI uh, symptoms. In acute MI patients, colchicine was also investigated and again, a significant reduction in the primary ischemic composite endpoint was observed. And again, about 20% of the patient did not support the drug throughout the entire study period. Now, the situation for statins is, as I said, uh, very much established. A lot of trials speed for the primary prevention setting, for the secondary prevention setting in stable or stabilized uh, ACS. And in all the studies, you note a clear relationship between the untreatment LDL, namely if it is the lower the untreatment LDL is, the uh, better you can reduce ischemic endpoints, as you can see here nicely in these three diagrams. The same actually holds true for the vulnerable plaque characteristic plaque burden. The lower the LDL on treatment is, it's actually shown on the y-axis, the more uh, the more you can achieve a shrinkage of your plaque, the x-axis actually represents uh, the mean change of person at the Roma volume. And you will note that if you achieve a non-treatment LDL that goes lower than uh, 70 milligram per deciliter, you will end up in an atro regression. There is also quite some evidence for that with statins, we can achieve compositional changes, at least if we consider the virtual histology endpoint necrotic or stabilization. And serial OCT studies have consistently suggested that the cap is thickening in the presence of statin therapy and macrophages are being reduced in the presence of statin therapy. And the same holds true for lipid deposits that can be significantly reduced in the presence of statins. What about PCSK9 inhibitors? Here we have consistent evidence from the Fourier trial for evolocumab in the stable coronary artery disease setting and for alirocumab in the uh, uh, setting of stabilized ACS. Both studies showed that the primary endpoint, ischemic endpoints could be significantly reduced as well as the individual endpoints, MI and revascularization that holds true for both trials for evolocumab and for alirocumab. Interestingly, the uh, drug evolocumab was studied uh, with respect to plaque burden reduction. And indeed, if you administer evolocumab, that will result in uh, a 1% plaque uh, burden reduction. The, the Glakov study uh, included a total of 1,000 patients. And actually, the frequency of atroregression will be increasing from 50 to 70% if you add evolocumab on top of 
statins. Discrepant results were found for uh, compositional changes achieved by evolocumab, as you can see here in these virtual histology sub-studies, no changes for necrotic core and no changes in terms of dense calcium that might be related to uh, the technique that was actually used. There is a case level evidence um, and one I have uh, depicted here that in the presence of PCSK9 inhibition, actually compositional changes can be achieved as shown in this patient near baseline with a, a lipid deposition that completely disappeared at the uh, seven month follow-up. We set out to further investigate on this question to which degree Alirocumab may lead to plaque shrinkage and compositional changes. We did include 300 patients presenting with acute myocardial infarction. And if they, uh, in the two non-infarct related arteries, there were angiographic irregularities. And if the LDL was higher than 125 in the absence of a statin therapy, we enrolled the patient and performed two vessel imaging in the proximal part by using NIRS and OCT. Patients were then randomly allocated to either receiving alirocumab or placebo. All patients received rosuvastatin 20 milligrams, and at week 52, we repeated the OCT, NIRS, and IBUS in the exactly same uh, coronary region. And the primary endpoint of uh, the Pacman Amy trial is change of person atroma volume, and the secondary endpoints for which the study is powered as well are change in maximal lipid core burden index and change in minimal cap thickness by OCT, and of course change in, in maximal lipid core burden index by uh, NIRS. We do assess several uh, endpoints on top of uh, imaging, for example, we assess platelet function, endothelial function, uh, we do a PET-CT sub-studies, we assess shear stress and QFR changes in uh, both groups. The study enrollment is com was completed in October of the last year. It was a multi-center European studies, including a total of eight European sites. And this is just a case example to illustrate how uh, uh, the study is being conducted. A 53 years old male with an anterior stemi smoking and uh, an LDL that is increased to 140 milligrams, no medication so far. You see here ang an angiographic irregularity of the RCA and uh, you can appreciate here the occluded or sub-occluded mid LAD lesion that was then subsequently stented. And uh, that was followed by optical coherence tomography of the proximal circ. And we can already see here that there is a vulnerable plaque with a lot of lipid and a thin cap in the proximal circumflex, which then also was confirmed by a, a lipid rich plaque. Uh, as shown by NIRS, a plaque burden of 53%. And the same actually was the case in the RCA that was subsequently imaged uh, by using OCT. You can see here a vulnerable plaque of thin cap fibroatroma at the left side, and then subsequently imaging with NIRS that confirms the presence of lipid at the exactly same position with an LCBI of 320 and a plaque burden of 61%. Immediately after the primary PCI and the imaging procedure that uh, of course occurs during the same time point. We don't take the patient twice on the uh, cath lab table. The uh, drug, in this case, alirocum of 150 milligram is in injected. Well, we don't know the results so far. They will be available in Q1 2021. But here you just see a baseline and the follow-up recording of a NIRS and OCT. I don't know which one is baseline, which one is follow-up, because of course the, the core lab is concealed to this. But the conclusion from this example is that there are, that there are considerable changes, even substantial progression or substantial regression. We don't know in the NIRS and uh, a massive uh, cap thickening as shown by the serial OCT uh, 
images. So I would like to conclude that the presence of lipid non lipid rich non obstructive coronary plaques increase the risk of MI and revascularization procedures and potentially death in multiple natural history studies, one of them presented today, and justify the use of the term vulnerable plaque. Vulnerable plaque should be identified using the av available techniques in the cat lab news or OCT and otherwise CCTA. The clinical value of adding focal or systemic therapies against vulnerable plaques on top of the commonly used optical medical therapy requires certainly further well designed studies, but you will hear, hear in the next talk of one of these studies and the Pacman Amy results will be available in approximately one year from now. Intense LDLC lowering by PCSK9 inhibitors or inclisiran is an effective and well-tolerated vulnerable plaque mitigation strategy, but therapeutic concepts beyond, for example, colchicine, uh, also require our uh, attention in clinical routine. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention.